Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Scorpio Solar Festival webinar of the 2025 initiative. My name is Alexander and I welcome you on behalf of the coordination group of the 2025 initiative. Today is the first day of the five days period of the solar festival with sun moving through Scorpio. And as we align with the energies of this great constellation, with this energy that goes deep into the matter, we invite us to bring our focus to the work with our accumulated debts, individual, group, and collective. Michael Linfield will take us on this journey, and I'm deeply grateful to Michael for taking this stand and leading and focusing us in this exploration. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Alexandra. Welcome, everyone. It's a real joy for, to be gathered together today at this particularly intense period of testing and spiritual opportunity in our planet. I believe we're all aware that we're facing this amazing confluence of energies with the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, the full moon, the upcoming elections in the USA. So the next few months are probably going to be some of the most intense times that we have experienced so far during this incarnation. And this is a good thing because it means that we can be effective. So let us begin our journey by aligning together. So take a couple of deep breaths to bring yourself to a point of stillness within the heart. And then visualize all of us around the world, connected heart to heart to heart, creating a network of lighted hearts a matrix of love. And this matrix is lovingly held by the great matrician, the mother of the world, in her fathomless heart. So together, let us rise in love and journey toward the realm of the soul that we call the fifth kingdom, where the presence of a greater love resides. And we intuit and sense the approach of the ashram of the Christ towards humanity, the fourth kingdom. And as we experience this, we realize that the bridge connecting heaven and earth and our two realms is built consciously and steadily through reciprocal approach. This path of reciprocal approach finally leads to emerging between the fourth and the fifth. So let us, as we stand, unite us as a group, blend our group aura with the aura of the ashram of the Christ to create a potent field for further revelation.
and we set the intent today to enter more deeply into the great mystery as a united group, creating a receptive field for insights from higher and more refined planes of being, which we then anchor and broadcast as sparkling seeds of fiery hope and promise into human consciousness. So let us open our eyes and see the image of the chalice in front of us. And this chalice represents the chalice of the group heart, the receptive field in which new insights will be poured. And the chalice that we will use to distribute what we have received to a world in need. So we'll use this chalice throughout the time together. So let me just explain the process we'll be using today. This is a group inquiry and it's in three parts. The first part, we explore what it means to redeem our debts. And then we'll have a time of harvesting our group insights. Then we'll move into the second part, exploring what it means to assume responsibility for collective karma. And then we'll collect more insights from our group so that we build this body of wisdom. We're using what a number of you know as the creative dialogue process where somebody says something and the next person adds to that. So we keep building on and building this temple of wisdom together. And then we move into the third part, which is a meditation ritual to prepare ourselves to function together with hierarchy as the saving force at this time on the planet. So that, that's, that's the, the process. So all of this is happening, as Alexander said, inside the influence of Scorpio that we know rules the path of discipleship. So it may be useful to begin our journey by recapping the particular labor that Hercules had to face in the sign, because it really does indicate the test in front of us as a humanity. So let's have a look at the particular labor, which is the nine-headed hydra. So let's just take this in. And we'll explore what it takes to overcome and defeat the nine-headed hydra, which is also called the serpent of desire. But let's just understand what these nine heads represent. And Alice Bailey in Labors of Hercules has said that three of the heads represent the physical plane, three of the heads represent the astral, and three of the heads represent the tests and trials of the mental plane. So let's name them. The three heads of the physical plane are the tests of sex, physical comfort, and money. The astral plane heads are the tests of fear, hate, and ambition. And the three heads of the mental plane represent the overcoming of pride, separateness, and cruelty. Well, that's quite a collection. <laughs> and if you look around the world at the moment, you may realize all of those heads are rearing their ugly face at the moment. And that is what we as the world disciple are being asked to overcome. So it really is very germane for now. And one of the things that we can take heart from is the motto of Scorpio that affirms victory, final victory. And as we know, the motto states, warrior I am, and from the battle, I emerged triumphant. So that's our guarantee of success, but we've got some work ahead of us. So let's figure out how Hercules goes about 
overcoming and defeating the hydra or the serpent of desire. Some of the things that don't work first, you can't go mud wrestle with the hydra. You can't sort of jump in and uh, thrash around and because you're going to get pulled under and drowned. And the other thing, which seems to be the obvious, is well, we'll just cut off its head. Cutting off the head of the hydra causes it to sprout more heads. So the secret that Hercules eventually discovers is that he has to kneel. And kneeling is a sign of humility. He has to kneel and grasp the hydra, pull it out from the mud and the mire and raise it up high into the light of day where it loses its power over us. The serpent of desire really can't exist in the rarefied air of the buddhic plane because in the buddhic plane, the lower desires no longer hold sway. So this is a wonderful illustration of what's in front of us collectively. How do we overcome the serpent of desire? Because Scorpio is also the sign of the light of liberation. And we have to overcome the serpent of desire because it costs the earth to feed the serpent on a daily basis. It is incredibly hungry. Now the serpent of desire has an insatiable appetite for satisfying the lower desires. And as we know with any pattern, any addictive pattern, it can never be fulfilled. It always wants more. So the serpent of desire must be overcome if we are to take the first initiation as humanity. And we've been told that this is what we're facing collectively. And the key is to understand that we don't live by bread alone. We don't just live by physical and material sustenance. Our true nourishment is the sole food of loving kindness and the will to good that lives at the deeper levels of our essential nature. So this is a, a very useful sign to look at as far as the labor, because it does hold the key to the task in front of us. So understanding the light of liberation that Scorpio offers, we can begin to explore the theme of today, which is recognition and management of accumulated debts, individual, group, and collective karma. So when Alexander sort of gave me that title, I went, really? You know, <laughs> that's quite a mouthful. And then I started to actually appreciate, yeah, this is, this is what we have to get our teeth into. So I sat down and here's what I wrote. And what I wrote was what was published in the invitation. But I want to read it because it, it was my first sort of synthesis of, of what the task is today. Until we have gained access to the spiritual goal that is the wealth and wisdom of the soul, we may find it necessary to take out a mortgage with a bank of materialism to finance our incarnations. Think of it as a student loan for the personality enrolled in the classroom of Gaia. Eventually, all debts and loans need to be repaid. Now is the time when these markers are being called in. Liberation from the karmic debt of matter is our task as we move towards a new sustainable and soul-powered model of living as incarnated souls. So I'd like to unpack this statement and also allow the light of new insights to enter our field, to enter the chalice, so that each of us can be inspired. And then when we come to the group sharing, that we will then build this body of wisdom together. So let's start by asking, what is debt? What does it mean to be in debt? Some initial thoughts that I had sound like this. So debt is incurred by spending what we have not personally generated ourselves. If we don't have it, we need to borrow it. 
if we don't have the personal ability to generate the needed financial energy ourselves at this stage of e evolution, we need to borrow it and go into debt. And then what we borrow, we invest in matter to meet our needs. However, all debts one day have to be redeemed and have to be repaid. So think about that in your own life. It, it, it doesn't mean you have to be guilty or feel bad about having debt. You just have to understand what debt is and what it takes to repay it and what it means to be debt free. Living as a soul means living debt free. There's another way of looking at this. When we are bound to the material plane for our source of energy, we know from the teachings that we're told it's the, the lunar petries who have hold over us. And they're really the managers of the spiritual bank account. We're actually uh, using their energy. So we're borrowing from the bank and the bank manager is a lunar petri. And then we're told in the rules of initiation that one of our tasks is the dimming of the 18 fires. It's our way of becoming debt free. And just to remind ourselves, what are these 18 fires? And we're told that they're the seven fires of the seven subplanes of the physical, the seven subplanes of the astral, and the lower four of the mental. So seven plus seven plus four equals 18. So the dimming of the 18 fires really means that the fires of the lunar petries are extinguished. And we turn to the true source of power, which is the solar petri, the solar fire. So when we become debt free, we become at one with the soul and therefore we become a source of blessing to our world. But when we're mortgaged to matter, it's like being in a debtor's prison. And as you know from Charles Dickens and other narratives of a debtor's prison, it's for those who cannot pay the price of their own freedom. So if we're in debt and if we owe something to, to the material forces, then we're temporarily detained and contained and are prisoners of the planet. And as uh, DK has informed us, our task is to liberate the prisoners of the planet, starting with ourselves. So being in debt is not just about money. It's about where we draw our source of energy. So when we're in debt, we actually owe something to matter. And when we borrow from the bank to finance our self-interest, then normally the, the loan that we are receiving from the bank, we're charged with a high interest. So self-interest, the repayment on self-interest is usually very high. And many people spend most of their time and energy each day servicing the debt going to work so they can pay the bills, which once again is nothing wrong. It's a particular stage of evolution we find ourselves in. So one, when we're captured in this particular cycle of material bondage, we are not able then to free ourselves so that we can invest our life energy in creating the future and building the new civilization. So there's more to material living. And I'm thinking of a Joni Mitchell song. I love Joni Mitchell. And one of the lines that always comes back to me is, there must be more to life than a mortgage and a lawn to mow. So thank you, Joni. So how do we become debt free? Because becoming debt free is part of preparing the way for the reappearance. Becoming debt free and learning to stand as a generative source of light and love ourselves for the world is our task. And we do it together. As a new group of world servers, we share resources. We have 
a collective resource. We place all our resources in the chalice. And Agni Yoga talks about placing all of our accumulations in the group chalice so that we can all draw upon them. And these collective accumulations inside the chalice of what I will call the planetary server, they really constitute the common wealth of our goodness. This is our true wealth. So let me place a few more seeds into the field to stimulate, and then we'll take a time just to share what each of us are, are picking up so we can build this body of new wisdom and new insight together. So when we commit to walk the path of discipleship, we're told that we step onto the reversed wheel. And if you think of the motions of the wheels, early on, as the wheel moves, we live inside a cycle which is taking from life in order to survive. But when we step onto the reverse wheel, we understand that the way to thrive is to give. That's how we sustain ourselves and sustain life around us. So it's a very, very different way of standing in the world. Whether we're here to take or here to give. And then we begin to understand the whole thing of it is by giving that we receive. And going back to Hercules, who had to kneel down in humility in order to overcome the, the serpent of desire, I'm thinking of those wonderful three lines that says, we kneel to rise. We give to receive. We let go to have. So living as the soul means that we are not grasping. We don't need to grasp material things because when we live as the soul, we now are in touch with a source of inner power that is ceaseless. So if you think of it, the soul is an endless source of the gold of wisdom, the endless source of solar power, and we're really moving from drawing upon fire by friction, the fire of matter, to moving into the ability to harness the power of the soul and to utilize solar fire. So this shift and this movement from the lunar petris to the solar petris, from being captured in matter and indebted to the bank of materialism, really is a liberation and a moving from dependency on fire by friction to dependency on solar fire. And this is reflected in, in the green movement, moving from fossil fuels and energy derived from combustion to solar power, which is derived from the nuclear heart of the sun. We're moving from energy created by fission, splitting apart combustion, to energy created by fusion, which is the harnessing the power of a unified field. So if you translate this into a new economic model, you could say that the new economy is based on the generosity of the soul. So becoming debt-free means that we have access now to a new source. We have solar power the generosity of the soul. And by giving, we actually participate in this great chain of blessing. And what we're learning is that as we become receptive and receive from higher realms, we turn around and give what we've received out into the world. So our life becomes this dual pulse of receiving and giving receiving and giving. And we know that when this happens simultaneously, there is this uninterrupted flow of life through us. We don't need to hoard things. Standing in this soul space, 
we have access to what I would call in uh, industrial terms, just-in-time energy or on-demand energy, which the soul provides us 24-7. So these are some, some thoughts just to place into the field. And um, it means, are we seeing the end of money? Are we seeing a cashless society? I know some countries like Sweden, it's virtually impossible to go into a store and use cash. It's all card, it's all digital now. And then I had a humorous thought while preparing for this webinar, thinking about the externalization and knowing that our elder brothers and sisters, as they descend into matter and, and to sort of take on the raiment of more uh, material aspects of the world, will, will these masters, will they be carrying cash, credit cards, debit cards, or do they have a Bitcoin account? I mean, how are they gonna get by in the world? I was, I was thinking along those lines, sort of, I, I don't need an answer. It was just more of a, a humorous reflection, but it also goes deeper to say in the future, how do we transact? How do we interact with the world? At the moment, we do it through the agency of a third party. That third party is money. The soul doesn't need a third party. When we live in a soul-infused society, we give of ourselves to everything. There is no debt because we are not borrowing from materialism. We are tapped in to an endless and ever sustainable source of wealth and wisdom and power that is the nuclear heart of the soul, which is our equivalent of the spiritual sun. So let's take a deep breath. I think this would be a great time to stop and maybe for the next, say, 10 to 15 minutes, for each person, if you have something to share, and I, I'd say even if you don't want to share verbally, if you could write it down, send it in as a, a in the question box, and then uh, Alexander um, will be taking these and transferring them to the chat so we can all see what everybody's recording. And then, as I said before, this is a dialogue process. So think of what you could add that builds on what's already been seeded in the field. And when you have something to share, simply click the raise your hand button and Alexandra will call upon you and unmute you. And then if you just offer very briefly your building block, your contribution, and then we'll do this and then we'll take a breath and then we'll move into the next phase, which is understanding what it means to take responsibility for collective karma. So why don't we just harvest what we've been receiving in this first stage of our journey. We can use the silence to digest. And then also when anyone's ready, just please raise your hand and share what you have to offer. So Alexander, do you have any raised hands there or are we all still deeply assimilating? For a second, there appeared to one hand and then it disappeared. So if uh, you were trying to raise your hand, please try to do it again. Okay, I see it now, yes. Um, Margot, you're unmuted now. Thank you. Um, 
I'm noticing a, <clears throat> a bubbling up of, of, um, of very fertile ground here. It's, it's like ground being turned over. There's compost there. Um, these seeds are, are planted in fertile ground. Um, and there's, the sun is warming them there. It just, I guess primarily a bubbling energy of uh, creativity. Thanks, Margo. There are several uh, comments uh, that came in questions. Daniela is reposting them. I can read them. Uh, Celeste wrote, one place to begin is gaining trust that all will be provided. We need very little to live well. Relaxing the impulse, tendency to grasp, to raise, to win. Another comment from Leslie. Thank you, Michael, for this inspiring presentation. Maxim of Scorpio provides in insights on the path. We rise by kneeling, we conquer by surrendering, we gain by giving up. Yeah, I'm reminded of what the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all other things shall be added unto you. Like, so that's that source that was talked about two comments ago. Got you unmuted. Thank you, Alexander. And thank you, Michael. I am uh, absolutely intrigued by mortgaged to materialism. And it's a, a wonderful way to think about this journey we are on and this critical moment uh, in the USA and on the planet, or I should say that vice versa, uh, regarding the choice that we are making and the opportunity we have uh, at the heart of the new group of world servers in the words of St. Paul to give all knowing we have lost nothing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. Tina, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, I came across this prayer just very recently, and I don't know if it came from the Tibetan Destiny of Nations I was just reading or from Tarkum Sardarian, but it's beautiful. The prayer is, I know, O Lord of light and love, about the need. Touch my heart anew with love that I too may love and give. Thank you. Thank you. That is a, a particular prayer that many of us use at noon every day around the world. It is a very potent prayer. Thank you for naming that and stating that in the field. We are here with Katja and Katja wanted to share. Hi. Uh, hi, Michael. Hello, everyone. It's um, those are interesting, really, I think, essential points here that you uh, threaded, Michael. Um, when I think about mortgaged, <laughs> I first of all think about our vehicle. So how we how we get the energy from our vehicle? Do we, so to speak, squeeze it out of our cells, or do we? bringing the energy of uh, etheric energy do we align ourselves with the great lines of energy and then draw because uh, whatever comes from uh, from above is given it's never uh, loaned 
um, it's given. If asked, you know, and then ask and you receive, right? And um, also the point is um, about the nature of work with karma. I just recently read a little bit in, um, from Ani Vizand, you know, and she she quotes she 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 has this thought there that the secret of karma was revealed to uh, at Kurukshetra, not to the uh, how she said that, not to the um, basically to not to the student, not to she she uses a particular word of uh, um, I forget, it, it doesn't matter not not to a spiritual seeker not to a student but to a warrior and that uh, resonates with the uh, Scorpio note right warrior I am and from that battle I emerge triumphant and that is the soul the soul that overcomes and um, I think for now we're not talking just about our individual souls and individual karmic equations, but uh, about the soul of the group and the karma of the group and the ways to work with it, with individual karma and with group karma. Um, it's it for now. Uh, thank, yeah. thank you, Katya. In fact, that's what we'll be moving into in a minute is looking at what does it mean to assume collective responsibility for karma so this this is this is what's in front of us and, and let's see if there are, are any more inputs into the field from this first stage of the journey um, alexander if there's anything to re read or anyone who wants to uh, speak and has their hand up let's take a couple more before we move on and then we'll take another time to share after we've done the second stage of the journey. A couple of comments that's been written, uh, everyone can read them in the chat box and meanwhile Iris is unmuted and then I will unmute Joe. Hello, I've, I've thought of money as imbued with love thinking of the money meditation on Sundays that we use. And, and so it comes to mind about that golden substance and thinking about it as soul light. Um, it, I just keep thinking of it as golden substance. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for all these and everyone for all the wonderful thoughts about this. It certainly opened up um, um, it's it's free. It's it's as you talk about the, the flow. I think it's freeing that flow that is um, is impeded in so many ways. Thank you, Iris. So we have time for one more. Is there one more? Uh, yes. Hello, Joe. Hi, and thank you, Michael, and thank you, Alexander and Katya, for sponsoring this. I must say the most wonderful impression I have from everything that has come so far is how Michael set this note, a lightened note, in talking about a subject that generally is so heavy for people. And I think there's a metaphor there that we can follow. The other um, underlying or the underpinning of it for me, Michael, is the curiosity that you've imbued into this uh, presentation so far that evokes our thinking in an enlightened way. So I'm very grateful for that because generally when we talk about money people it becomes so heavy and to continuously bring it into the light and use enlightened words uh, related to these topics i think is so important as we move forward so thank you very much thank you joe 
So let, let's take a deep breath and move into stage two of our journey. What does it mean to recognize and manage accumulated debts in the form of collective karma? What does it mean to take on collective karma and pay off all past debts? That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a huge question. And uh, sometimes it's like, my gosh, I've got enough dealing with my own stuff this lifetime. You mean I've got to take on the collective debt? But we do it together. So what I want to do is give you an example of something I've been part of recently, well, in the last couple of years, that was an entry into, into this task. And I will describe the process sufficiently so that you understand the steps we went through, but I won't go into all the specific details because that's, that, that's more, not say private, but it's more the intimate outworkings of, of a group. So this is the Meditation Mount uh, Board of Directors. And over the years, and I've been on the board for like 21 years now, um, over the years, we've always had issues and problems. And then we thought, oh, right, it's because so-and-so did something in the past, and that's why this has happened. It's, everything's messed up because somebody did this a while back. And you can't get anywhere that way. And it dawned on us that if we are, as Agni Yoga says, being invited to precipitate the future into the present, we can't do that if the past is distorting us and not allowing us to be present. And so we said, look, if we're really going to do this, if we're really going to fulfill the promise of Meditation Mount, that is its destiny, we have to liberate all the past karma, the collective karma. And so we said, we accept full responsibility of all the karma generated over the past 50 years by the members of the different groups that have been responsible for this center, regardless of who did what. So it doesn't matter who did what when. Standing as the group disciple, it is our karma. We can't say it's somebody else's. And this was incredibly limiting, li liberating, because the, the, the limiting factor before was that we said, well, we can't do it because something happened in the past. And basically, we became the victim of the past. We became, we allowed ourselves to become the victim of somebody else's action. And so when we assume responsibility and said, we will take it on, something shifted in the field. There was a lot of work we had to do, a lot of cleansing and looking at the patterns. And we went back and looked through different lenses, energetic lenses, psychoenergetic lenses of what were some of the patterns laid down by the founders? Because a founder is usually somebody who has a very clear first ray energy that anchors something so it's, it takes root. And yet, as I know from living at Finhorn, when Peter Caddy with his first ray energy anchored things, he realized that later on, there were other aspects of himself that were undeveloped that needed to be added to his first ray um, vehicle. And so we realized that we had to assume full responsibility. And so we did a lot of soul searching and, uh, and rituals and, and owning up. And by owning up is not saying that I'm guilty, but owning up is that I own it. When I own something, I can embrace it with love and I can redeem it. I cannot redeem something that I don't embrace. And this isn't just about human to human interaction. We realize that things that happened on the land that had caused the disruption and the disturbance in the field. And I'll give you an example. When Meditation Mount was built back in the, well, it was 1969, 1970, and then it opened on April the 11th, 1971. So we're coming up to our 50th anniversary next April. In order to have a nice flat surface to construct the buildings, they bulldozed the top of the hill. And we had a feng shui expert come up um, as part of this, um, looking at our collective karma. And they tuned in and said, oh my goodness, do you know what you've done? And we said, no. 
you've beheaded the dragon. And we said, what? He says, yes, the head of the hill is the dragon. And you, you, took, you, you took its scalp off. You scalped the dragon. And we went, oh my goodness. So we as humans, with our wonderful intent to do good and anchor a center of light, weren't fully aware of the total impact on, if you like, the full spectrum of this ecosystem that is Gaia. So we went back and communed with the earth and sort of apologized, made reparation and uh, did whatever we have to do. But it goes beyond just karma generated human to human. It's the way that we've used the mineral kingdom to fashion metal into weapons of war to kill other, other people and animals. That was not what the mineral kingdom was intended to be used for. So it, it goes down to something as simple as that. You know, what are our actions? So I use that example and we're still working on it as a group, but it was incredibly liberating because now we're able to be inspired by the future and say, yeah, let's do it. Even though at the moment we're facing a financial crisis like a lot of other nonprofits during this COVID-19 um, period, and we've got about enough cash to take us through for two more months, but we're not panicking. We're just saying, okay, let's do what we have to do. Make sure the field is clear, clear from the past constraints, but clear enough to receive what we're being given all the time from the deep resource that is the, the commonwealth of the ashramic energy field. So I use that example um, to show what it actually could mean to take on responsibility. And here's where I want to, I guess, challenge us as a new group of world servers. And I'm calling ourselves, as we named it um, about a year and a half ago, the planetary server. So when we stand together as this network of individuals and groups serving the planet, we become the planetary server. So what if the planetary server says, we will take on the debt and assume responsibility for the collective karma of the esoteric community accumulated over the centuries in order to clear the field and prepare the way? Wow because it may even be that we ourselves in earlier incarnations have contributed to the karma. So it isn't just, oh, it was somebody who did something in the past. This is a living field where past, present and future um, stand together. Uh, and so I'm thinking of that wonderful statement and um, I guess it was a, transmission through Alice Bailey, where she had her thoughts on the reappearance of the Christ called, um, I stand and wait. We're familiar with that. And towards the end, the Christ says, look, I'm coming, but I need a path of light to walk on. And that path of light is a human field that is debt free, a human field that is soul infused, and a human field where we have taken responsibility for our collective karma. So my question to ourselves is, are we willing as the planetary server to take on the collective karma that we and others have generated over lifetimes? Are we willing to walk the path of the world savior and become the saving force by assuming responsibility for this collective karma? So if humanity is destined to become the world savior, and to become the light of the world, it would naturally seem obvious that the planetary server would help take the lead and show the way by taking this first step. So that's the challenge I'm issuing to myself and us. Are we ready to say yes to this? Because it will then allow us to join forces with the ashram of the Christ and together stand on earth as the saving force. Not in some glorious way of saving humanity from itself, 
but the saving force that is able to redeem and release the light in matter. It's able to help humanity move from a dependency on the fire by friction to a lifestyle that is solar powered, which is soul driven. So if we're willing to do this, I would like to do this in the third stage um, and, and to do a, a ritual where we do this together. Um, and in one respect, it's serious, but serious doesn't mean heavy. And often I will say to people, um, let's be lighthearted. And they think by lighthearted, I mean, let's be frivolous. So instead of saying lighthearted, I've turned it around and say, let's be heart lighted. So what I'm inviting us to do is to be heart lighted as a group and to use the light of our group soul. It's like some big Tong Lin meditation. We're breathing in our collective karma and recycling it, upcycling it, redeeming it, composting it. So that, that's the challenge. And um, I'd like us just to take a few moments to let that register. I don't have any authority from, from anywhere else to issue this challenge, except that I'm prompted to do that because I believe it's what is being called for from our group soul. And I simply um, am daring to, to put into the field what I believe our group soul is inviting us to do. So what I would like us now to do is to take a moment in reflective silence to listen to the soul of the planetary server. And then we'll open the field again for another 10 minutes just to see what responses are being stimulated and what's emerging in the field. So in issuing this challenge to ourselves, let's take a moment to allow it to sink in. And this invocation will cause an evocation. So let's be silent together in the living silence of the group soul. So what is being evoked inside our group field at this moment? Let us give voice to it, either by writing it and we can share it in the chat or by raising your hand and you can speak it into the field so that we can all share in our harvesting together. So please, whenever you're ready, let's take 10 minutes just to collect what we have to offer. So we're responding to the tension of need that is inside the consciousness of humanity and the planet. So let's hear from each other. Thank you.
Yes, hi, Michael, this is Martin. I have a couple of thoughts. I really appreciate what you've said. The saving force, as I understand it, has to do with making the three one, Shambhala, hierarchy, and humanity. And the energy needs to circulate in two directions around the triangle. What makes it possible is that Shambhala has touched humanity directly in 1975 and then in 2000 and perhaps again in 2025 and making this dual circling of the triangle possible. The key, I think, to the saving force being implemented is adding the will to the love aspect. That is Shambhala at the top or apex of the triangle. DK tells us that Hercules, who fought the Hydra, has since, once he has become the triumphant disciple, has since entered Shambhala. He carries first ray force. And that first ray energy is meant to come through groups. So the key to this is to realize these elements in the drama and this turning of the spiral and moving up an octave in group formation to work with will energy as well as love and together invoking that which could change the world in an instant. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's really illuminating. Appreciate that input. Is there anything to be read, Alexander, that um, people have sent in or not? There was a comment from Kit. Um, many servers, those Hubble, I'm not sure if I pronounced that name correctly, is an example. Uh, many who are taken uh, on the work of collective trauma and responsibility. Yes, Thomas Hubel. Thomas Hubel has been doing a lot of work on the collective wounding and collective trauma. And he is certainly a person who's helping to liberate us from the, the entrapment of, of the emotional plane. So yes, Thomas Hubel. And it's in, interesting, this, the, this sound reverberation between the words karma and trauma. Yes. There's another there comment. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's one comment, a couple comments, and uh, one hand raised. So I will read from a comment from Daisha. Yes, Kate, but we are each also responsible for clearing our own shadow and thereby lighten the collective shadow. Each nation has its own portion of collective trauma to view honestly and openly, then to digest and clear the energetic debt. Oh, thank you, Daisha, up there in Canada. And somebody who wants to speak into the field? Uh, yes, Misha, you are unmuted. Please unmute yourself. Sasha, переведи, пожалуйста. Yeah, Misha um, is asking to translate for him. He's in Ukraine. Yes, mm -hmm. пожалуйста, Misha. Uh, на мой взгляд, метод... Uh, работы с кармой, помещением ее в групповой сердечный центр, сопряжен с большими опасностями. In my, in my view, uh, in my view uh, method of working with uh, collective karma by putting it into the a group heart center is linked uh, with some uh, dangers. Uh, этот метод подходит для uh, гармонизации конфликтов, но он также uh, должен содержать фактор или как это коэффициент синтетической соизмеримости. This method is good uh, to uh, work to harmonize uh, the conflict. But it also would have to include uh, aspects related to um, 
Synthetical measure. In, in synthetic measure. Or measurement. Yes. Yes, I understand. Для работы с кармой обозначенной, на мой взгляд, важно, чтобы группа была достаточно объединена и могла подниматься на уровень атма будхического слоя. In order to work with this uh, level uh, of karma that we're talking uh, about, it's important that the group would be unified and able to uh, elevate, to come to, uh, to the level of uh, buddhic atma. Atma, buddhi level, buddhi plane, subplane of atma. atma right. Buddhi. And yeah. I have... I have to uh, add that in the beginning, uh, Misha said, in my opinion. Yeah. So, oh, oh, okay, um, Misha, thank, thank you, Misha, because it's a, a very wise cautionary note. Because my rule of any alchemical process is the crucible that you're using to contain the elements that have to be redeemed must be stronger than the elements you put into them. So we're not going to be foolish and sort of um, just take on more than we can handle. We do it, as Daisha says, you know, one bite at a time. But the fact that we say yes to doing it, and then we do it sequentially. So, Misha, thank you. Um, we are not going to be foolish. And yet, we have to utilize that word of power called daring to dare. So, um, are there any... Могу чуть-чуть еще в завершении. Just a few more, like a few more oh, words. Yes, of course. При вот таких возможностях универсальная цель такой работы может быть трансформация кармы в дхарму через очищение, сплавление и ориентирование на универсальную цель. Yeah, not easy to translate, so I, I'll try. Uh, so the purpose for uh, this uh, type of work could uh, potentially be transmutation uh, of uh, karma to dharma, uh, orienting, orienting it to the universal purpose. Towards the universal purpose, yes. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, yes. Transformation, yeah. Yes, it's it's transformation, transfiguration, absolutely. And we do it one step at a time. The thing is, it's time to take the next step. So um, thank you, Misha, I appreciate your input. Um, I'll, if there's one more comment that needs to be read bef before we move into um, our third stage of the journey. Where were we yeah. journeying up, um, up a mountain together? There are several more comments. Uh, I will read uh, from uh, Maka. <laughs> Self-sacrifice, confidence, understanding of oneness, acceptance, generosity. Um, sorry, and I lost it. Since these traits are not widely expressed by humanity, it is up to the new group of old service to express it, to lead by example. And there are a few more comments that uh, everyone can read in the chat. There's one from Helen. Whatever we see out there that we do not like and criticize, we are at least a little responsible for. We can look within and find that behavior or thought in ourselves and transform it. And there was a question or comment uh, for another from Martin. Uh, Michael, could you define the karma of the esoteric community? Ah, that's a very good. Uh, it's, it's all the things that have happened whether it's all the infighting inside the Theosophical Society, it's the infighting and, it, and it's the, the sort of tense uh, relationships between maybe the Agni Yoga groups and the Alice Bailey groups or the Rosicrucians and the Steiner. It, it, it's anything 
but has not yet created a co-resonant field, a harmonious field. So it becomes clear. If there's still tension in the field, there's still energy bouncing back and forth. And so it, it's, it basically is an act of forgiveness. And we know that uh, DK says the highest form of forgiveness is really the law of sacrifice. You give your life for something. And so um, I think it's whatever it means. I'm not saying that we swallow the whole thing at once. I'm just saying we say yes to taking on the task of redeeming first our own individual, our group, and then collective. Because as somebody just said, we have to take the lead. So this isn't foolishly rushing in with some sort of uh, image of ourselves as the grand savior. It's simply responding to the deep core of the soul of humanity that is destined, we're told, is destined to be the world savior. Maybe this is the first appearance of the world savior by a small group of, of us saying, we're willing to do this work, whatever it means. And, and I'm, I do that in all humility. And as we know, the Tibetan says humility is an adjusted sense of right proportion. So I don't want to overinflate who we are, but I don't want to underinflate or deflate the power that we have together when we say yes. And so it, it, there is risk involved, but there's a greater risk in not doing anything. Um, and, and I guess that's where I'm coming from. So taking all this into consideration and just knowing that we are not alone, that we are being supported and we're in partnership and in communion with our elder sisters and brothers of the fifth kingdom, the postgraduate humans, the, the masters, whatever name we give to these wise beings who mentor us and work with us. I believe that um, we can step into this role because there's no other way of breaking the cycle of hatred, the cycle of greed. If you go back to the nine heads of the serpent of desire, in order for humanity collectively to be freed from the clutches of the serpent of desire, it means that a percentage of humanity has to liberate itself. And I'm saying, let us be that percentage. So let us take a deep breath together. and center ourselves inside the group heart and feel there the deep joy and love that burns at the heart of who we are as a group. And let's go on a journey together. We visualize ourselves standing in a circle on a high plateau in the Himalayas, just beneath a majestic mountain peak as the sun goes down. And in the center of our circle is a great fire. And this fire burns and warms us and illumines our faces. And we see each other as fellow pilgrims as brothers and sisters in the one work. And into this fire, there descends the presence of a greater fire the fire of love. And the fire now turns in to the brilliant opalescent flame of the Christ. This is the redeeming fire. And we begin by placing into the fire all that we wish to let go of, that we are holding on to as guilt, as debt, as pain. 
we offer it in love to the purifying fire of the Christ. And then we take something from the group field, a group pattern that may be part of our own particular serving group. And lovingly, we place that in the fire so that it may be redeemed and the life within it liberated. And each time we place something into the opalescent flame of the Christ that burns at the center of our circle. Everything is reduced to ashes and the light is released and the ashes go into the soil and enrich the path beneath our feet and create the path of return, the path of light upon which the Christ will walk. And now as a group, let us draw closer to the fire the opalescent flame of Christ. And as we draw closer, it doesn't burn us. It warms us. It illumines us. And together as a group, we step into the fire of love that is the heart of the Christ. And we are consumed and purified and born anew in this love, through this fire. And standing as the planetary server, we ask, May Christ be born in the cave of the heart of the planetary server. May Christ be born in the cave of the heart of humanity. May we play our part in the one work through group self-forgetfulness, harmlessness, right speech, and joyful striving. So let us move gently into the next phase, the final phase of our work together. And to help us hold the focus, we're going to be using an image of Nicholas Rurik, a painting that we know as burning a way of darkness. So let's together enter into the auric field, the magnetic presence that is this painting and what it represents as the return of the light, the coming of the saving force. Let's enter and be filled and impressed by this light.
And let's draw even closer into this mystery depicted by Rurik. And we approach even closer. And we bring our focus on the casket, carrying the stone from Orion, representing the saving force the light that will redeem the earth. And we will leave this image on the screen as we sound the great invocation. And because we are acting now in the way that we're able to as an aspect of the saving force, we will be using all three phases of the great invocation that were given out in 1935, 1940, and 1945. And I will pause between each of these three major stanzas. Let the forces of light bring illumination to mankind. Let the spirit of peace be spread abroad. May men of goodwill everywhere meet in a spirit of cooperation. May forgiveness on the part of all men be the keynote at this time. Let power attend the efforts of the great ones. So let it be and help us to do our part. Let the lords of liberation issue forth. Let them bring succor to the sons of men. Let the rider from the secret place come forth and coming save. Come forth, O mighty one. Let the souls of men awaken to the light and may they stand with massed intent. Let the fiat of the Lord go forth. The end of woe has come. Come forth, O mighty one. The hour of service of the saving force has now arrived. Let it be spread abroad, O mighty one. Let light and love and power and death fulfill the purpose of the coming one. The will to save is here. The love to carry forth the work is widely spread abroad. The active aid of all who know the truth is also here. Come forth, O mighty one, and blend these three. Construct a great defending wall. The rule of evil now must end. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, 
Let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. May we stand together with the ashram of the Christ as a saving force on earth. Namaskar. Thank you everyone for our time together and we may wish just to remain in silence and allow the, the power and presence of this moment to infuse us fully so that we may carry it with us in the days ahead when it is most needed on our planet. <laughs>